Good morning. Just a quick update, um, in case you missed them. There's the TVs right there, and uh, they're scheduled to be installed tomorrow at 1 o'clock, so if you'd like to come help oversee that project, you're more than welcome to, to come join me. Um, it might be a little cold, but we'll work on that. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, a very important topic, and one that's long overdue. And it, it, it's not a fun one. It's not one that I'm like, oh, yippee, I get to preach on this one today. But uh, I really think it's necessary. And I'm going to, as for my introduction, I'm going to start by saying our institutions are, or have been guilty of at least, corrupt. There's a lot of corruption involved. I don't know if you've heard of the CDC's Tuskegee experiment in, that ran from 1932 to 1972. They promised impoverished African Americans free health care, mainly uh, uh, crop shares, or what, that's not the word. Forget the name. What's the list? Yeah, yeah, they promised them health, free health care and mental health care and everything else to participate in a medical study for six months. And as you guessed by the dates, it ranged from 1932 to 1972. It was far more than just six months. They knew that some of these men had syphilis and had effective treatment. They had the means to treat this, yet they gave a bogus treatment for a made-up illness of bad blood, just to see what would happen to the human body. And as a result, many died, their wives got it, and even babies uh, were born with it. So just terrible, terrible things. In 1941, the University of Michigan deliberately infected patients at several mental institutions with influenza by spraying the virus directly into their nasal passages. In the early 1940s, the University of Chicago, in conjunction with the United States Army and U.S. State Department, tested the effect of malaria on a prison in Illinois, as if their lives weren't already difficult enough, as well as on psychiatric patients at the university. In the, in the 1950s, the U.S. Navy conducted a simulation of a biological warfare attack on San Francisco. Did you know that? by spreading a bacteria in the city, and this was called Operation Sea Spray. Many got sick, and one person died, and the family of that man that had died sued. And guess who won in the court case? The United States government. Shocker, right? <laughs> Does that surprise anybody? In 1950 to 1972, mentally disabled children at the Willowbrook, Willowbrook State School in Staten Island, New York, were intentionally infected with viral hepatitis and they claimed it was in order to make a vaccine, or they were testing a vaccine to um, make a cure for hepatitis. One doctor promised the parents care and treatment for their children. In reality, the procedures were infecting them by feeding them extracts of infected feces in order so they would contract hepatitis. In 1939, at the Iowa Soldiers' Orphans Homes, think about that, this is a Soldiers' Orphans Homes. So these are orphans of veterans people who lost their lives. In Davenport, Iowa, 22 children of the monster experiment, as it was um, come to be called, underwent psychological torture to see if they could get these orphans to stutter because of psychological torture. And more recently, I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen the news of Jeffrey Epstein and the human trafficking and the scandal and how many people were involved with it and how many people were connected with this man and I hope that you're sick to your stomach and a little angry. I hope you are. Because that is how we are supposed to feel when we hear about corruption and malpractice and abuse of the innocent and the vulnerable. And you know, by the way, none of these things were conspiracy theories. I didn't include anything that was questionable. You can look all these up. These, these are all well-documented events, and I just had to kind of pick and choose which ones I wanted to talk about. But I think these were kind of some highlights of our history. But is this a new problem? Is this unique to the American government or American medical institution? I argue no. You can find corruption and abuse in all countries, everywhere, and in all times. Because corruption and abuse, abuse of power, is a human problem. And it's existed since the fall. And you may be surprised to learn that human corruption and abuse of power takes up a large portion of our scriptures. Now, why do you think God would care to have us know these terrible instances of abuse in scripture? 
Well, we're going to consider that this morning. So first off, we're going to consider what does the Bible say about abuse of power? Second, how does God feel about abuse of power? And finally, how should we feel about abuse of power as Christians? So to the first point, what does the Bible say about it? Well, I want to consider, first of all, Hagar in Genesis, in Genesis 16. And we've talked about this a lot. In Genesis 16, 1 through 6, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And we know they were getting old, and God had promised them a child, and they were just getting older. They weren't getting any younger, as the expression goes. And they became scared, and they thought, we have to have a child. Verse 2, And Sarai said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, does she sound like a person or an object so far? 100% an object, property. Verse 4, and he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abraham, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Who had the power in this situation? Abram and Sarah. Who was God's chosen family here? Abram and Sarai. How did they use this power? They used it to abuse this servant girl and create her life much more hard than it even needed to be. Because after all, she was a slave. She was a servant. She was not a free woman. So later on, Isaac is born. And Sarai doesn't like it very much or because she, she wants rid of Hagar. She thinks there's too much contention. In Genesis 21 and verse 14 it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. All right, so you have a woman who's been a servant her, her life alone in the wilderness with a newborn baby. What's not in the desert, in the wilderness? Food, water, shelter. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look upon the death of the child. And she sat opposite him. She lifted up her voice and wept. Who had the power? Who put her in the situation? This is very sick stuff. But does God leave her alone? Absolutely not. And we can read God gives her promises and she calls the God, the, the God who sees, because he saw me in the wilderness. He heard me, and he came to my defense. Was any of this God's design? No. This was made by humans' machinations, right? We start thinking, we start planning, and we create victims. God's people failed in this instance. Next, I want to talk about David and Bathsheba. And if you'll notice, I'm highlighting events of God's people who were involved in abuse of power. David and Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 2, we know the story well. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Okay, who was on the roof? David. His house overlooked all the other houses. There would be lower. So it's not like she was just, you know, showing everything, you know, for the whole community. She was in her house. David was on the roof. David essentially was being a peeping Tom. And so just by the mere elevation, David's up here. She's down here. There's a power imbalance there, isn't it? We see it even signified with the language. And we all know the story. He looks, he sins, he takes, he kills. Later on in verse 26 and 27, uh, sorry, I lost my place here. Uh, he takes, he kills. Verse 
I lost my place. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. But the point, if you look in verse 26 and 27, we realize that we see who the Lord is angry at. And it says, David. God's mad at David. It doesn't say Bathsheba. And in verse 4, it says, Now there came a traveler, of 2 Samuel 12, verse 4, it says, Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. This is, of course, when Nathan rebukes David for his sin. And what is Bathsheba compared to here in this story, in this analogy? The slaughtering of an innocent lamb. So, so David taking Bathsheba is compared to the slaughtering of the lamb. Bathsheba lost her husband, and not only that, she lost her child that she gave birth to, David's child. But how does God respond to this? He's angry at David, but he also promises her an heir. David's son Solomon will be king. She secures, or God secures Bathsheba's baby, much like Ishmael with Hagar. God secured her offspring, both victims of abuse, of God's people who were supposed to stand as beacons of light and image God's love and his care and his stewardship and what happened under human stewardship, even of God's people. Victimization and abuse. And if we go on, a worse story, Amnon and Tamar. And this is, to me, one of the most heart-wrenching scriptures in the entire Bible. It's very difficult to even get through, but I think it's important that we read it. Look at 2 Samuel 13. 2 Samuel 13, verse 11. Amnon was the king's son who wanted to be with his half-sister Tamar, if you remember this. He, along with an evil counselor, they conspired to lure her by feigning illness to capitalize on Tamar's tenderness and empathy. How sick is that? And verse 11, it says, But when she brought him, them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. She answered, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she... He violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get up, go. But she said to him, No, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man who served him and said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore, and she laid her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. How did David respond to this? He was angry, but essentially he did nothing. He did nothing. Who had the power in this situation? Who was stronger? Amnon was. And Absalom, who's Tamar's brother, he kills Amnon. David won't do anything. <laughs> Me as the brother, I will. And he tries, it, it, it snowballs, and eventually it leads to, uh, to Absalom taking over the kingdom from David. And we see that it doesn't end there. More abuse continues. In 2 Samuel 16, verse, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in 2 Samuel 20, verse 3. It says, and David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king cooked. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 16, 21. It says, Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. And all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father, and the hands of all who are with you will be strengthened. Gross stuff. What happens to these women? Look at 2 Samuel 20, verse 3. It says, And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house and put them in a house under guard and provided for them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. Who were the victims in these events, in these accounts, in these stories? It was these women who had no power in these situations. They were victims of something that was completely out of their control, and things got more and more out of control. So this leads to the second point. 
How does God feel about abuse of power? Isaiah 117. It says, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Well, where's really my responsibility in all this? I mean, bad things happen all the time. God says, you plead their cause. That's what I made you for. That's why I made you a kingdom of priests and kings to rule, to reflect my love, my care, my stewardship. That's your problem. It's not my problem. It is your problem as an imager of God. Micah 6, 8, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. In Micah 3, 9, it says, Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is right, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. What was Zion? What was Jerusalem supposed to be? The house of God. The manifestation, the recreation of the garden when God dwelt with man in harmony. And how did they build Jerusalem and Zion? They built it with blood. Verse 11, its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. They felt secure in their abuse because we're the religious leaders. We're the ambassadors. We have the authority. Therefore, you know, God can't get mad at us. You know, we're, we're in the temple. We're Jews. We're part of God's people. Nothing can happen to us. And God says, ah, I'm going to upheave Jerusalem. I'm going to upheave Zion. Jeremiah 22, 3, it says, Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. People that you think, I have no responsibility for them. It's not my problem. God says it is your problem. Amos 2, 6, I want you to get the rich picture that's painted here. Amos 2, 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Now, you may wonder what on earth is up with the cloak or the garment taken in pledge. Well, back then, if someone owed you money or they say, hey, can I borrow some money? I don't have enough food today. I need to get food for me and my family. I didn't catch enough fish. My crop wasn't enough. I need to feed my family. Can you loan some money so I can get some bread for my family? And they'd say, oh, yeah, sure. Just give me, uh, give me your coat, and then I'll hold on to it, and that will be a sign that you're going to pay me back. And then once you pay me back, I'll give you your coat back. Fair enough. But what happens at nighttime? It gets cold. What are you supposed to do as a fellow Israelite if you see your Israelite brother shaking and shivering in the cold just to feed his family, and you're holding on to his cloak right there? You give him his coat so he doesn't freeze through the night. Duh. And yet, what were they doing with it? They were spreading them out in the temple, laying down, drinking all the sacrifices, becoming drunk with the sacrifices. It says, not of those who have been tithed, but those who have been fined. They were using it as a gain, as a system to benefit themselves. They were abusing their position of power and authority and victimizing the people they were, they were appointed to minister to to take care of, to feed. In Ezekiel 34, 2, it says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. I think it's easy when we read the prophets to be like, oh, 
that sounds so harsh. You know, why is God talking about this doom and gloom and destruction and bloodshed? It, it's very, it makes so much more sense when you realize this is essentially a Nuremberg trial situation. God is setting up the appointments, the leaders that he has established and holding them accountable for the job that they have failed to do, for the abuse that they have done in his name and in his holy place. So finally, how should God's people respond to abuse of power? I think first and foremost, we need to be aware of it. We need to realize that we can be guilty of it. Why do you think all these things happen to God's people, by God's people, and was written for God's people in the future to be aware of? Why do you think God had all these stories in the scriptures for us to read and meditate on? Why is Amnon and Tamar in there? Why is David and Bathsheba in there? Why is it? So that we can hold up a mirror to ourselves and look and be on guard of these things. And I think three ways that we can be guilty of it. There's a lot more than these three, trust me. But here's just for this morning. First of all, marriage. Marriage is one in which God has trusted the male as the leader, as the head of the household. Therefore, with us being in a position of authority or power, we need to be all the more careful of it. Colossians 3.18, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. I want to make something very clear. It does not say, husbands, make your wives submit. That's not your job. The wife's job, you know what your job is? This is the part you focus on, husbands. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. It's not your job to make them submit. It's your job to love them. And what does love entail? What does 1 Corinthians 13 tell us? Love does not insist on its own way. Is not rude. I tell you, that's a pretty high standard to follow there in marriage and husbands. We have to give an account of that. Who here was, who, uh, was um, very nervous to meet their potential father-in-law when they were dating their spouse? You know, it's kind of like, oh, you know, I got to make sure, make sure I have a good impression. I think it's very funny, or not funny, but sobering. In 1 Peter 3, uh, 3, 7, it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I tell you, you're scared of meeting your spouse's dad. What tell you meet her heavenly father? And you have to give an account for how you treated his child, his daughter. We have to be aware of that. Because it is so easy. We, we can fall into that. We may not even realize it, but we must be aware that we can abuse our position of authority and just harass, harangue, and bully our spouse until we beat them into submission rather than just focusing on our job, which is loving. In parenting, Colossians 3.21, Paul writes, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You know, children are very easy, easy to, um, to abuse because they're defenseless, right? They, they don't have any means of escape, of fighting back, and God's going to hold you accountable for that too because you can bully, you can harass your children into where they're terrified and just lose hope altogether. I think some children are, are beaten into faithlessness because of the discouragement that they face continually. And I think finally in the church, 1 Peter 5, 2, it says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And what did Jesus, what was Jesus' standard for who would be the first, who would be the authority, the rulers in the church? But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. So in God's eyes, in Jesus' kingdom, you know how Jesus' kingdom rolls with authority? It's whoever's the servant, whoever serves the most. And finally, what we need to do, how we should feel, how should we respond to abuse of power? Speak up. Speak up. Proverbs 31.8, it says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 24, 11 says, Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. 
If you say, behold, we, do, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay every man according to, your, to his work? God knows. And just saying, I didn't know about it. Guess what? That sounds a lot like the Nuremberg trials. I was just following orders. I didn't know the extent of it. I was just doing this. No, you're going to be held accountable. Ephesians 5.11, it says, Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Galatians 2.11, I think, is very powerful. I think sometimes people use this as a license to correct anybody and everybody publicly, however which way they see fit. But you need to understand what's going on here. Galatians 2.11, we, we remember that Paul rebuked Peter to his face. Why? Because he acted hypocritically. Because when the Gentiles, he was eating with Gentiles, but then when Jews came along, he withdrew from them. Who was Peter? He was a pillar in the early church. He set the example for a lot of the members, for a lot for the babes in Christ. And who was very vulnerable at this time? Gentile converts. They were fish out of water in this environment. All these things were news, new to them. And a pillar of the church withdrew from them. And so Paul rebuked him to his face because of the harm that he was doing to these babes in Christ and the poor example he was setting to the Jewish brethren. He spoke up. Because that could perpetuate abuse. And just personally, and we'll read one more verse, and I'll just share this very quickly with you. I, I, when I was a teenager, I was in a situation where I was made aware of a big-name preacher who was sexually exploiting minors. And me being the scared child I was, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to handle that situation, I did what I thought was best, which was try to speak up. And in response, I was maligned, I was put on trial, I was gossiped about and ostracized in many ways, not from my home congregation or anything like that. I don't, I don't want to give details. But the perpetrator who continued to try to do the same thing that he had a pattern of doing was coddled, was protected while I was silenced and, and, and cast to the side, really. And at that point in time, I was this close to leaving the faith. And I don't say that with any, it breaks my heart to even think about it. I was this close. I was hanging on by a hair because all the people that I was taught, that I learned, that was supposed to get involved in situations like this, that was supposed to be Christ's imagers, you know, elders, preachers, respecting, expecting them all to do the things they were supposed to do, and I didn't get it. And I was the outcast. It makes you doubt the whole institution. Not God per se, but the whole institution. And I tell you, thank God, very literally, thank God he put the right people in my life who did the right thing. They stepped in, they spoke up, they dealt with it, they took it all off my plate. They gave me a lot of hugs, a lot of prayers, a lot of Bible studies, and brought me back and restored my faith in the family of God. What about the people who didn't have that? I was fortunate. And I, you may think that this is just a one-off. It's not. It's not. You talk to people. You get close to people. You, you hear the nightmares. You hear the terrible stories. You hear about the abuse. And you wonder, how are you even here? And that's where we are supposed to step in and be God's hands. We don't tolerate abuse. We speak up about abuse. We don't silence it. We don't shush it. We don't keep it to the corners. We expose the darkness with the light. And finally, 1 Peter 3.18, because we all like to think, um, but sadly it's not the case, there is no perfect victim. There is no perfect victim because the truth of the matter is even when we have been victimized by something, we often victimize other people. We lie, we gossip, we malign people that make us mad, we want to get them angry or we want to hurt them in some way and we perpetuate that abuse. But there was one perfect victim, or victor, I should say, and that's Jesus Christ. First Peter 3, 18, he says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus was the perfect victim, the perfect victim sacrifice because he didn't sin when he took on all the hatred of the world and when satan threw gave him his worst he cried out father forgive them they know not what they do not cursing them 
not cursing the Father, but suffered perfectly so that we, you, you, me, we can walk in a newness of life where we don't perpetuate that abuse, we don't tolerate that abuse, but instead we bring healing, we bring atonement, we cover for one another, we love one another as Christ has loved us. And if you would like to receive that forgiveness, to no longer be a victim, but be a victor in Christ, we ask that you come forward, be baptized, repent of your sins as we stand and sing.